Hey everyone, Gingerbeard Mark here. In this episode, I'm interviewing the brilliant Rob Ringham. Rob lives, he's from the Midlands, but he lives up in Glasgow now, and he came all the way down from Glasgow to uh, be interviewed in my back garden, which is amazing, and I'm really grateful to him for. We talk about the Iceman, we talk about Club Zarafusa, we talk about lots of his other books, lots of his other writing, we compare notes on who's the bigger comedy geek. I think I think it's pretty even, to be fair. I think it's pretty even. Um, but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the brilliant Rob Ringham. Welcome to my back garden, Rob. Thank you for having me. It's beautiful <laughs> here. Thank you. It's so only the second time I've interviewed someone in the garden. And it's like, I, I quite like it. I quite yeah, like it. It's, good. it's great for me. It was Fliss Kitson. Yeah, Fliss from the Nightingales. Mm. Yeah. But it's great for me because I don't have to go anywhere. I have to lug all this <laughs> stuff around with me. No, it's good. Thank you. It's the perfect place to do it as well. Yeah. When we, when we used to do podcasts, we called this the podcastery. And when you sent me a picture of it earlier, I thought, oh, he's got the nicest podcastery. It's perfect. There was a brief time where I was like considering it a sort of bit, a back, back, uh, like a pub beer garden. Yes. So it's like the ginger beard arms. It's the ginger beard garden. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's great. Um, I'm a big, big fan of uh, some of your, some of your works. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. I'm wearing your words. Yeah, we're, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's nice to finally talk to you. With uh, this, this is kind of what I'm trying to do this year is make some of these internet pals, yeah. like real life human beings. So. Yes. How does it feel for you? Because I feel <laughs> like I feel like we're old friends. To yeah. be honest, it doesn't feel. We, it doesn't feel weird. It doesn't feel weird in any way at all. It's just, here I am, I'm at Mark's house. Yeah. I know I haven't been here before, but looking at you, I'm just thinking, we've talked so much, but we yeah, haven't. Exactly. We really haven't. So it's amazing. And I think that's good. That's a good sign. Yeah, I think that's a good start. Yeah. It's a good jump off. Yeah. The interview's going to go well. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, so th- there's two sides to your work. There's probably more sides to yeah. your work, but there's two two obvious sides where there's like the sort of... Um, documentary comedy sort of yes and then there's your more fiction based stuff yes that's right well like do you do you have a preference is of which you prefer doing or? I, I think the, the what, what you call the fiction based i think yeah. that is what i consider the core of what i do so there's, there's actually two separate sprouting offs from that yeah, so you've okay. got the new escapologist stuff which broadly speaking you could say that's like lifestyle guru stuff but (laughs) but it's in a very tongue-in-cheek kind of way and also the alternative comedy histories so i consider them both kind of side projects in a way okay so the main thing is the fiction which starts with my short um my short comedy pieces which is uh, a loose egg and stern plastic owl those those are the two collected versions um and the new novel so that's kind of what i consider the core of it so that's really what grew out of stand-up that was my first love was stand-up comedy but then I quickly started thinking oh you know naturally I'm an introvert I like the writing process I like being at home I like being with my friends and being out with crowds I don't know it's wonderful and I have many happy memories but a little draining and I thought no I'm going to be the quiet boy I'm going to find another way of doing it and actually, without getting too derailed, I think the Club Zarathustra thing was on my mind too. Okay. It was the, the you know, stand up was forbidden at Club Zarathustra. It was, let's find other ways of being funny. Yeah. So I think that's what I tried to do with my short pieces. And now that's grown into writing novels, hopefully. So that's the core of it. Yeah. But the, no, the, the, the documentary style stuff, um, that's very much uh, following my passion. You know, like th- these were. I had access to interesting people and I thought, well, let's get some answers because I can represent fans in this as yes. well. I can be a fan on the inside <laughs> and talk to these cool people that I've always loved yeah. and finally get some answers, i.e. Iceman. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that's, you know, I think I think I said it in the intro to my Iceman interview was like, uh, I wanted someone, that, I was so happy that that book exists, you know, and I'd wanted that for so long of like, this, you, this guy who's hinted at and the same with Club Z is like, 
it's this thing that gets mentioned. You're like, what's? I want to know a bit more about that. What's yeah, going on with yeah. that? Like, you'd seen the photograph, and yeah. you? you'd always thought, what is that? It's all my favourite guys in one room: yeah. Sally Phillips, Kevin Eldon, Johnny Vegas, Stuart Lee. And you think, what is this? Simon Munnery, of course. Yeah. And you thought, what? all these guys kind of came up together. That's amazing to me. Uh, let's find out. And yeah. just for years, I didn't. And I thought, well, maybe there's an essay in it. I could write an essay for you know British Comedy Guide or something. But the more I got talking to people, the more I realised they had stuff to say about it. And I thought, oh, it might be a book. So yeah. that was my first ever book, actually. That was the first time I got a book. Oh, okay, out. Wow. 2012, yeah, yeah. And so, and that came out um, through Go Faster Stripe. Is yes. That, how did that come about? It, it was in the most literal, informal yeah. way you can imagine. It was. <laughs> I, I was thinking, well, who on earth is going to buy this book? It's going to be the nitty gritty fans, the people who like what I like. Yeah. And when I'm normally in a pub talking about comedy, they say, "Oh, you like Frankie Boyle, do you?" And I go, "Yeah, of course I do." But it's never. Simon Munnery, it's yes. never, you know, the Iceman. <laughs> so it's, uh, well, occasionally it is, and then you've got a friend for life yes. when you meet the right people. Absolutely. Um, but no, so I thought, no, it has to be the kind of cult crowd, it has to be the cool kids. Yeah. Um, so I thought, go faster, stripes the ones. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll be lucky. So I emailed Chris, not that one, and <laughs> uh, he was just replied really quickly and said, I'd love to read a book about Club Zarathustra. Yeah, do it. And I think at that point, the book was kind of half done. I'd got interviews in the bag, yeah. but not all of them yet. Uh, so then it was just, I knew the book could be, I knew it would go somewhere. So therefore it was, let's finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Gave you the encouragement to finish it, that someone was interested. Though. Exactly. So it was, I thought they would, I thought there'd be some interest, yeah. but I had to check with someone like Chris Evans <laughs> first. And he was like, yeah, do it. I'd love to read about Club Zarathustra. Yeah. Because so, yeah. at the end of the day, it was like, uh, there's amazing stuff that Chris produces, but he's just a comedy geek like us at the end of the yeah, day. Exactly. He, he's, he's rubbed the magic lamp of comedy <laughs> geekery and he, he's really the fan on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've uh, interviewed him as well, and he's such a fascinating guy. And like, again, like it, he spoke to Stu and was like, "Oh, when's '90s comedian coming out as a show?" And he was like, "Oh, it's not." And yeah. then he just went, "Well, if someone, if that's you know, I want to see this, so I want let, let's make it happen." That's right. And th- th- there's something to be said for that, isn't there? It's like is, if there's this thing out there that you want to see. Yeah. that's n- no one's made well then maybe you should be the one to make exactly. it exactly i remember the the list magazine gave it a pretty lukewarm three-star review <laughs> this book and one of the things they said was uh maybe someone who was actually physically there at the time they should have written it and i thought but they weren't writing it that, yeah. that would never have happened so you know we could wait another 20 years in the hopes that someone would write this book but they never ever would no. you just need one enthusiastic fan <laughs> who's you know a nerd and likes writing and being alone in a room and isn't too frightened to actually pick up the phone and interview people yeah and uh there's not many people on that venn diagram <laughs> so you're one of them yes but, you, but i didn't know at the time <laughs> <laughs> and then go, so going back to stand up then before for the books how long did you do stand up for i probably tried to do stand up in earnest for about two years so okay. not very long that's about the same length of time that i tried to do it as well. i didn't even know that <laughs> well you you no, i'm sorry you're gonna have to tell me about your experiences <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i was gonna say is like so was that when you were living in the midlands then that you did that or was no. That, uh, no well actually my first ever comedy experience was the midlands yeah. when i was i think 14 or 15 oh, wow. believe it or not it was birmingham hippodrome which is quite a good <laughs> yeah. place to start uh so it was uh it was a thing for kids basically it was uh we had to enter a I think it was a write a funny poem to get an audition. That was the audition, basically, write a funny poem. Yeah. And then it went off and they selected kids from the schools. And then we could go to a comedy masterclass where comedians would teach you the, the basics of the craft. So I met some guys who wrote for Bill Bailey. Uh, there was a guy who wrote for a show called Confessions. That was a Saturday night kind of show in the 90s, I guess. Uh, and some working circuit comics. And they would teach you the, the business, basically. Yeah. And then you, you're working up to having five minutes of material that you could perform at the Birmingham Hippodrome. So as a, a young kid, this was amazing because I'd seen, you know, pantomimes and, um, you know, comics doing yeah, their yeah. work at the Hippodrome. It's like suddenly you're on the stage at the Hippodrome. It's like, whoa, this is absolutely wild. This is amazing. So yeah, three of us from the school, we went off, did this thing. That was my first ever try. And I like to say that Josie Lawrence from yeah. Whose Line Is It Anyway, she was on the panel of judges and she said I was the third best. So <laughs> I've always used that as a little thing, you know, third best child. <laughs> <laughs> no, my my first the first ever time I did it was at um it was like proper deep end stuff was um 
Beat the Gong, or is it Beat the Gong? Yeah, I at, don't, I don't think com- I've ever done a Beat the Gong, yeah, but I've seen them, yeah. At the Comedy Store in, oh, wow. um, in Manchester, and it was possibly one of the worst <laughs> experiences of my life. I don't know why I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to keep doing stand-up after this. This, this went really <laughs> well. It was like uh, Alan Cochran, I think, was the, the host. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry about that, mate. That didn't go well at all. Oh, <laughs> so... no. That's not what you want to hear. <laughs> um, but, yeah, there was something about Like, again, and it was being a fan of comedy. And so, how, well, how do, how do you get into this then? You know, how do you get into this world? And that seemed, at the time, like the most easy way of doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not necessarily easy way, but, like way that I could do it was I, mean, I could get up on stay. I didn't have to buy any equipment. I didn't have to spend hours writing something and whatever. I, I could just get up on stage and try and be funny. Exactly. Try being the key. Try being. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the thing about the gong show is it's fun to be gonged off anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even when it goes badly, it's kind of what you're there for. It's like sitting in the front row at the, um, you know, where, where you get wet. You know, it's sort of, yeah. no, no, let's let's have fun with this. And I, I want to be gonged off. That'd be great. Yeah. It'd be sad to not be gonged off. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so, but it was about, I think it was about 12 years ago was the last time I did stand up and that was like yeah. a one-off um, because like someone I'd been on the circuit with was doing a charity thing and had sort of invited loads of people that were on the circuit with her uh-huh. and um, yeah, it went really well. It was a packed room, new, uh, the New Hampton Arts Centre in, uh, in Wolverhampton. Yeah. And, uh, and and so that was felt like a nice place to stop. It's like I I don't know if now after after doing that and I had you know I hadn't done stand up for a good year or two before that. Um, it felt like a good place to like stop and go. Okay, well this is better than ten people in a pub hating my guts. Yes. So like, if should you, we just leave it here? If you know it's not going to be your <laughs> thing forever. Yeah. Just if you're never going to stop. Now is a good moment to stop. Exactly. Yeah, I see. I see that. Yes, 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 yes. And 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 I'd found at that point I'd started like producing music videos and doing stuff that wasn't necessarily comedy related, but there was squeezing the my artistic juices in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in other ways, you know what I mean. Different creative outlets. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. That I'd never had when I started doing yeah. stuff. But you're glad you did it, right? I think mm-hmm. so. Yeah, I think, and it gives you that little bit of experience so now when I do talk to stand-ups like you know professional stand-ups I do feel like okay well I've got a little insight into your world I do know what it's yes what it's like you know what I mean yes it helps I think so so why why then why only two years for you I I think I just wasn't in love with it enough Mm. I think I was a fan I loved watching comedy and I did want to try it I wanted to see it from the inside but I don't think it was ever going to be the main thing so as I was saying bit of a quiet boy my favorite thing was the writing and coming up with oh, just the sensation of getting those connections in your brain yeah. you think oh these are the two things that marry that make the joke i love that feeling it's very satisfying but you could have that a lot more with writing books i think yeah uh just the the coming together of things that you've observed i mean there's the lovely flow of stand-up you know if you if you speak to someone in the audience who you know they say something that you know about and you can just go boom this is what i know about that thing because uh, you've been recording stuff from a comedic point of view for years. Yeah. So if there's someone in your audience from Bilston, you can say, oh, I know this about Bilston, and it sort of works. <laughs> That's lovely. I love yeah. that. You don't really get that with the books. But, yeah, yeah. But, but like, yeah, the thing about the two ideas coming together and just that sense of... You know, this is the gunpowder sparking. Oh, I just love that so much. But that's a writer's thing. So yeah. went into writing. But yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's like with the stand-up, you have the writing... And then the performing, don't you? Where it's like yeah. you're just focusing on the writing. Just the writing, exactly. Yeah. Although I must say, I do think about perform. This is weird, but I think about <laughs> performance on the page, which is a strange thing. But I do try to add motion to it. Yeah. So sort of show, you know, whatever image I'm putting into the reader's head, I want that to have motion. That's something I think about. And I probably wouldn't be thinking in those terms if I hadn't ever tried stand-up comedy. Um, yeah. You know, so it's all good. But no, I very quickly learned that I didn't want to be a club comic for example so I started cheating very early on where we'd set up our own night at, ah, a, okay. at, at an art centre or something so there's straight away the crowd's going to be there to see you I, I realised straight away that like open mic nights you can't have the the confidence trick that a comedian really needs because everyone knows you're new so I yeah. learned really quickly 
people talk about open mics very positively, like, oh, this is where I learned the craft. That wasn't really my experience. It was sort of, no, I want to, you know, have my name on a poster and people to be there and that's the confidence trick. Yeah. Whereas with the open mic, it was they know you knew, they're giving you a chance or they're not giving you a chance. Uh, and I just quickly knew that that wasn't a, an authentic experience. That, I'm not saying that's what every comic ever thinks, no, but no. that was my take on it. Yeah, yeah, it's, again, yeah, similar for me, where it's like, yeah, the open mic nights, and you could, you're gonna, you, you're gonna get sandwiched in between two other comedians that might have nothing to do. Right? It'd be completely different from what you're doing. Yeah, and that could change the audience. You know, if, if they've just had like a prop comedian, and then you've got to come on after that, and you're doing straight stand up, it's like, well, yeah. what's this? So if you've had someone who's doing very sort of easy like you know observational stuff yeah and then you're going into something that's maybe a bit more avant-garde or a bit more like you know i'm still in awe of comedians who can deal with that yes so when you go to a package show or uh, even just you know um, friday night at the stand or something and you've got four or five acts yeah and they're all completely different that it's, it's, i'm just always amazed how they can come into a, a climate that's completely not set up for their yeah. stuff but they, they make it work. And I just think that's a miracle. And that's one of those magic tricks that comics do that I can only just, you know, fantasise about. Yeah, really. exactly. But you get that for doing it for 10 years or whatever, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> yeah, and the, the the driving miles and miles to just do 10 minutes <laughs> yeah. to a despondent crowd. Just Forget like, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and when you realise you don't have to, <laughs> you could put on your own night at your <laughs> local art centre or something and just, just have a lovely time. Yes. But but that doesn't make you a good comic. I think you have to take the rough with the smooth. Yes, absolutely. Well, and I, I wasn't yeah. prepared to take the rough, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much the same. And it's like once I found sort of interviewing people and that I, I in, that I enjoyed that as well was like ah oh, this is this is I find this much better of like sort of picking something apart or like trying to find out stuff about people like the sort of investigative side of interviewing I found more rewarding in some ways than yes. than doing ten minutes of stand up to someone that to a yeah, a room full of people that don't give a shit. <laughs> Basically, you know what I mean? I think the thing is a lot of comics love that. Yes. And I think that's part of their fuel. But if you and I, if we just don't have that, then, you know, try something else, I suppose. Exactly. Stand-up just wasn't for us. But I suppose like not. Say. But things grew out of it, Mark. Yes, you know, we, we both tried it and things sprouted off it, <laughs> and, and that's great. So Club Z was your first book through... Um, Go Faster Strike. Yes. And then Stone Plastic Owl after that. But you don't... you've. You published stuff in between. That, that's right. So yeah. there was a huge gap. Uh, my friend Ian McPherson is an inventor of a famous joke about um, uh, they say you play this venue twice in your career, <laughs> once on the way up, once yeah. on the way down. Great to be back. And that's very much the case with me <laughs> and Go Faster Strive. So, yeah, I did go off and do other things, more, uh, you know, uh, just, yeah, publishing in the meantime, and that was great. But, um, yeah, there's just something about Go Faster Stripe. You know, I was watching a live feed that they did with Will Hodg- Hodgson. Yes. And he was saying oh, it's sort of like the rough trade records of comedy production. So <laughs> like, yeah, I kind of see what you mean. Yeah. You just, you know, you're going to get an intelligent readership. You, you know that they're um, sympathetic. You know, they know what you're doing. They get it. And yeah. they're willing to try something new and experimental. So, great, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, Chris's business model is good. It all works. Yeah. So, you know. Why yeah, I, uh, you know, since day one, I've been chucking him a fiver a month for the singles club. Like, yeah, it's important know. to do that. <laughs> yeah. Go faster stripe singles club. <laughs> but, you know, and it's great, you know, to have little things pop up in my inbox like once a month or whatever. He's like, you know, a new book from you or his uh, new, you know, um, show from Simon Munnery or Tony Law. And you're just like, this is it's brilliant. I have like five pound a month and I get this yeah. amazing stuff popping it, up in my inbox once a month. It's all your favourite stuff. Yeah. Basically. And it's like a it's a streaming service that's just for people like us, yeah. basically. The rarefied streaming service <laughs> of Go Faster Stripe. Yeah, it's a miracle. I, uh, I think Robin Ince is as dumb as you was the first yeah. thing I ever bought from uh, Go Faster Stripe. Is that Faster the one where he's waving on the cover? He's like in he's the in sea. He's in the sea, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's in, he's in <laughs> a suit a, in the sea. Such a good photograph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of my first loves in live comedy as well. Yeah, because yeah, he used to do that book club thing. Yes. I used to love the book club, yeah. Yeah, at Edinburgh and then down at London and whatnot, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I, I mentioned that to him um, when I interviewed him in February, the book club, because I, I think the first time I met him, 
He was walking outside Wolverhampton Art Gallery, either to or from the train station, with a suitcase full of books. Yeah. And I was like, how long is the show tonight that you need <laughs> a suitcase full of books? So uh, it wasn't just a newspaper and an orange. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> like, look in this. But I, I, every time I see him, he's always got a huge pile of books that he's carrying around. Like, where do you keep that's, all That's these? Robin Hood. <laughs> But yeah, that was the first one, and then it was like, oh, it was like you know, it's um, you know when people say they fall down rabbit holes of like yeah. YouTube or whatever. It was like that of Go Faster Stripe. It's like, oh, and there's a Richard Herring one, oh, and there's a Stuart Lee one, and there's a. It was probably Stuart Lee. Was that the first one they did? Nineties comedian. I think yeah, it yeah. probably was. That was probably my first. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then the Simon Munnery's Hello was quite soon after yeah. that. And Herring was doing them. He was doing like Menage à Un and things and. Yeah, oh, come on. It's just, <laughs> I'd already seen all these shows live, but the idea of getting a DVD of it as well yeah. that you could have forever was just absolutely the mutts nuts. You know, it's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. So the, the second one through Go Fest Strike was Stern Plastic Owl. And yeah, what, how would you describe that's collective writings, isn't it? It's, co- it's like little short. Yeah, pieces. it's it's a it's a, a collection of humour writing. So this is what I do instead of stand up reading. Really, <laughs> is I just do these short things. Uh, they're quasi fictional, I suppose you could say. So they're yeah. usually based on something real. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just something that's occurred to me. But yeah, it's um, yeah. Each one's about eight hundred words. Oh, okay. So it's uh, just very short little bits of writing. Uh, but but what I would say is that each sentence is honed, right? Yeah. It is honed the flip out. It's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so my, my my other books that aren't these two examples of yes. Bruce Egg and Stone Plastic Elves, they are books of paragraphs, whereas these are books of sentences where every last sentence has to have some sort of craft in it, uh, hopefully for comic effect. Yeah. It's supposed to make you see a particular thing in your mind. And so the work that went into those little books is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, they, they were written over years, actually. So I, I collect the stuff over years, and then when there's enough, it'll be a collection. Yeah. So there'll hopefully be a third one. Okay. Hopefully, fingers <laughs> crossed. So, yeah, so so it's not published anywhere else in the meantime. No, like it's I just mean, stuff well, you I, I'll put I'll put most of the eight hundred word ones will go on my blog. Yeah, and that's what I consider like the test. That's like the work in progress. <laughs> so that will get comments or it won't get comments and emails. And so I'll say, well, okay, people like that one, and I can see what works. Yeah, uh, but I'll also put things in magazines. So I, I do a lot of work for the Idler magazine, uh, and just all over the place. It's just little bits and bobs that I'll try and sell to magazines first and then if they're good and if they're comedy based they'll go into the books yeah yeah so that's it so that's the collections but no most of the time they're even if they have been published elsewhere before it's not the finished thing mm. so the the book is the finished piece that's it so yeah and that's when i feel like i've exported it from my soul that's when it's done and gone and yeah. i don't think about it anymore but no some of the things in there i love them and i've done some of them on stage as well I, you know, you can do these weird gigs where people are doing readings and stuff. Uh, I love those. Yeah. So I've got my favourite one is um, uh, called uh, To Resuscitate a Fly. I like that one. Uh, and there's one called The Hungriest Hippo, which yeah. I like. So I've put these in a section of my website under faves. Yeah. So if people just want to come and read the best, they can just come and do that for free and then leave. <laughs> uh, but if they like it, they can buy the book as well. So where is the website? Then, if oh, it's ring, just ringham.co.uk, folks. Uh, Mark's going to put it. <laughs> <laughs> there <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what, why is that so important? Then why is why can't you just like to toss? Why can't you just toss off an idea? Why do you have to focus um, in? Is that well, like, well, when it's stand up, you do it and it's gone. Yeah, uh, which is one of the lovely things about stand up. But when it's in a book, it's there forever. Those books are in the British Library, <laughs> so you know it'll be like when I'm dead, when we're all dead, they'll yeah. still be there on the shelf. And I've, I take that responsibility very seriously. Oh, okay. So it's got to be right. And also, you people are inviting you into their home by yeah. buying a book, and that's going to be on their shelf. Uh, either, you know, in the W's next to <laughs> P.G. Woodhouse and uh, John Wyndham, I think my friend said, <laughs> yeah. uh, or it's just in the sort of book, you know the the toilet book section. <laughs> 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 with Carl Pilkington and stuff I'm fine either way wherever it goes uh, somebody showed me a picture of it in a charity shop thinking oh this will annoy him but I loved it yeah. that's brilliant that's, that, that's like the end of the cycle for my book it's you know it's been somewhere it's been on a journey and now it's back in a shop I like that but I feel like I, I cleared out a load of books recently to a charity shop because there was like, well, I've, I've read these and I've enjoyed them. You know what I mean? It wasn't necessarily a, a, a judgment on the no. quality of the book at all. It was just like, I, do I need to really hoard this stuff just because it looks good on a shelf? Exactly. You know, and so it, 
I feel like yeah, it's not uh, to see some in a charity shop's no no insult. And you know, Robin Ince is probably going to buy it. Uh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> you can read it along with crabs or something at a book club night. Uh, but no, we we actually recently counted our books for the first time. Yeah, uh, we got five hundred books, which to me is quite a lot. But yeah. Robin Ince is at home going, <laughs> do me a favour. <laughs> it's, it's nothing really. I was reading some book and she said she'd got two thousand books, and I thought, yeah. oh, I wonder how many I've got. So we counted them up. Our shared collection. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah five hundred books. So yeah, but I'm filtering them out all the time, all the time. Yeah, as you say, it's not about quality. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no judgment on the books. It's no. just like I just exactly. That's so it. much. It's like you know, I used to take a pride in collecting things when I was younger, and now I'm I'm much more of how much can we clear out of there? Yeah, how much space can we get? Oh goodness, I've written so much about the minimalism and the kind yeah. of the joy of just getting rid of stuff, and I think that's actually it. Might as well be called Confessions of a Sci-Fi Fan <laughs> because when I was a kid, I loved Star Trek and things. And I collected yeah. all the junk. But like you know, why does being a Trekkie mean you have to own a Spock's head? You know, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. You don't need all that stuff. So no, just just you know, whatever. Just it, be free. Just be free. Yeah, it doesn't bring you happiness either. That's the no. thing. Is like buying stuff as an adult that you wanted as a child doesn't doesn't fill that void. <laughs> it does for some people. You see these YouTubers; they're all people of our age, Mark. And they're, you know, you know, rebuying all their Thunderbirds toys or whatever that they threw out when they were kids. Is Paul Putnam one of those guys? Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't know for sure. What is he called? Chaff. He had a word for it when I said when I interviewed him, and he sat behind loads of records and comics. And I says, wow, that's impressive. And he's like, it's chaff. <laughs> so I can pinpoint the point. If I started reading it now, I can pinpoint where I would die before I would finish reading it. <laughs> we should talk too much about other people. Yes, but that's this true, is about sorry. us, but Paul sorry. Butler is the, Paul one of the funniest Butler. people who've ever lived, really. I know Curious Orange is the thing he's most famous for, <laughs> but he's just funny. I just see him and he's just, just a funny man. Yeah. Funny bones. But I think, like... It, this that it's bound to happen when me and you get together that we're going to talk about other comedians because that's what that's what brings us together. That's what you yeah. know. It's like oh, you like this, I like this too. <laughs> we can get further into Club Z if you want. Yeah, or, or we could talk ice related things. Well, yeah, we're definitely going to talk a bit more about um, Anthony Irvine before uh, for the mics go off. Definitely. <laughs> but so um, new, like you say, new escapologist. Yeah. Uh, that- that is supposed to be it doesn't matter anymore but the original idea for that it was it was supposed to be a spin-off of the humor stuff yeah it was supposed to be like an in-world thing where the the slightly fictional robert ringham of the books <laughs> is writing the or producing this magazine and you can like get something from his world like you know in nightmare on elm street where they get freddie's hat yes. it's like that you're reading this book about a fictional man and you can actually get something from his world that was the original premise of it uh but it strayed from that <laughs> because it's actually the most popular thing i've done it's yeah mo- if, like that sells so many copies and so i know what people like about it so i give them what they like about it yes I don't yeah, try you lean to, into it yeah exactly lean into it so uh <laughs> yeah so that's kind of its own thing now and it's just got legs but so what is like to someone that doesn't know what what is yes yeah, so it's, it's, it's a magazine it's yeah. a magazine about the idea of basically giving up your day job to do something creative yeah so if you're you know if in your heart you're a ceramicist but you're actually having to you know be an accountant because that's what is your mar- more marketable skill or you just don't know how to break into the thing that you yeah. want to do it's basically that and so some of the things we do we talk about are super radical other things are actually pretty conservative and anyone can do it um so we like to go from extremes so i always think well there's this guy jacob who knows how to play the stock market and that's how he made all of his money yeah. to help him escape and then there's another guy martin who just basically accepted you, you know he looked poverty in the whites of his eyes and went i am going to be a dumpster diver for the rest of my days because i prefer that than working in an office slowly dying yeah uh, and i think i have so much respect for both positions <laughs> so they're both motivated by the same force yes. but they've come to it in different ways and i think that's a nice thing about the mag actually it's a place for these very different kinds of people to kind of come together yeah that have the same sort of anti-capitalism yeah anti- I mean Jacob yeah. is using the stock market which is not an anti-capitalist yeah, yeah, thing yeah, to yeah, do, yeah, yeah. But, but in some way they want out that's why it's called escapology it's about breaking out yeah, yeah, yeah. and actually it does go back to my stand-up thinking as well because when I was trying stuff I was interested in reading about and learning and hearing about uh, unusual 
forms of performance how do they do it so i was interested in learning about well how do ventriloquists do it how do magicians do it not because i wanted to do those things yeah, yeah, yeah but what how do they do it how do they command an audience in this unusual way so i read all these books about the history of magic and houdini was fascinating i yes. recommend reading it anyone should read a houdini biography they absolutely fascinating human being and so that was the thought that was one of the things so in my in my night job of meeting comedians and realizing oh there are other ways there's people who don't try to please the tax man or do what they were told to do by their parents or career advisor i'm going to do this weird thing yeah and it's going to work and even if it doesn't work at least i've done what i loved i went oh yeah there is another way and so these two ideas of escapology coming from these houdini books and talking to real people who just did these odd things for very little money, I thought, oh, yeah, there are all these different options. Yeah. So that was the birth of New Escapologist, yeah. That's cool. And, and, so, and there's, you're, you're the editor of that, but there is, there's other contributors to that and everything. You're, yeah. It's not just a solo Rob Ringham. No, but... I mean, you wouldn't know that from reading. So <laughs> we, had, we actually had, a, we had, we had some years off. We did what we said was the final issue in 2017. Yeah. But uh, I felt like bringing it back, so I just did. So we just brought it back after five years, uh, and I wrote a lot of the current issue. Okay. So, but normally, <laughs> normally, no, there's lots of different contributors. We have different columnists in this. We've got Tom Hodgkinson from The Idler, um, Aparla Chowdhury from, uh, she, she's a journalist in London, um, McKinley Valentine from Australia, all these really interesting people from around the world. Yeah. They all have columns. Uh, so, yeah, there's, that's, that's one of the nice things about it. It's, it's like a package show almost. It's multiple voices in one, yeah, in one but thing. all with that same theme, the same yeah, motivation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. How how do you escape the sort of nine to five? How do you escape the nine to five? Yeah. Although we we always say if you like the nine to five, that's for you. Yeah. Do good. Do that. That that means you're happy. We, we're not saying oh it's bad to do the nine to five. Yeah. It just so happens most people think it is, <laughs> and when they're thinking about a life of freedom and you know being creative and doing what they really love, <laughs> it's usually outside that nine to yeah, five exactly, idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I put in as a as a creative type. I definitely put in more hours than anyone who's doing a nine to five. Like you know, yeah. it's ridiculous the hours <laughs> I put in, but they're hours doing something I like to do. Yeah, and that's very true of a lot of the people who write for us as well. You know, yeah, it's it's nonstop, is it? You know, it's, um, when I interviewed Sage Francis and B Dolan, the two American sort of independent rappers. Yes, and. Um, they both ha- had takes on that where it's like, yeah, it's great being independent because there's no record label telling you, oh, you can say this, but you can't say this, and you can do this, but you can't do this. But there's no one telling them, all right, it's 10 o'clock, you should go to bed now and stop answering <laughs> emails, or, you know, it's it's time to put this down. Yeah. In, in that same way, you know, being independent and self-employed or whatever you want to call it is great in some ways because it's that freedom, but it's... Yeah, you know, I, I mean, it, but I'd say again, it depends what you're doing. Yeah. It's sort of if you're if you're a self-employed accountant, yes, you should be putting your pencil down at <laughs> six o'clock and going yeah. off and being with your family because your job is still a means to an end. But actually, if if you think your reason to live is writing books or painting yeah. pictures, then why not do it till three in the morning? Absolutely, can, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So that's that's one of the joys of it. To me, that's real freedom, just being able to just do what you want. Yeah, uh, and if it's a weird thing that's not wholly marketable, so much the better. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But yeah, if you can make a living from that, that's just that's the dream, isn't it? You know, I, I always uh, think of that. Um, Stuart Lee often quotes John Hegley as saying something like, "If you can get a thousand people to give you a tenner yes, a, a year, that's as, a you, living. as you're touring, right, that's a living." That's yeah. it. Did he say he might have said a hundred thousand? But yeah, that, I never know what the number. I always get the number <laughs> wrong when I quote that. But that was in the nineties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because I always say it and I go, hang on, I don't think that is enough money to live on. <laughs> <laughs> I live on barely yeah, anything. <laughs> So, like I say, I ha- it's one of your things that I'm not as familiar with is the new escapologist. But whenever I sort of read about it, I'm always like, oh yeah, I need to. Start yeah, because more attention because you like it. fringe things. Yes, You're exactly. not interested in the most popular things. So what does <laughs> you like to get into the margins? <laughs> exactly. If I could find a way of paying my mortgage by interviewing people in my garden, yeah. I absolutely would. <laughs> it could happen. Give him some money. Pay whatever it is he's asking in the Patreon or whatever it is he's or got. Buy some lovely merch. You buy some lovely merch. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Rubber Dub Dub, is, yes. I, which I don't have a copy of yet. That's okay. But that's your. Um... I would have brought you one, but we've sold out. <laughs> the first print run has sold out, so that's oh, good. Unfortunately, that's... sold out. It's not <laughs> unfortunate. That's not unfortunate. <laughs> so tell me about that, man. Yeah, oh. Rubber Dub Dub is my new novel. Your, is that your first? First ever novel. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to do two more. 
Okay. Uh, so this is the start of something. It's not a trilogy. They're not three. You know, it's not going to be the same characters or anything. But I've got ideas for three novels. That I think I've got legs. So. Oh, I'm on camera saying that now. So yeah. if they don't appear, everyone will be <laughs> calling me a cunt on the internet. But that's okay. They're allowed to. Um, yeah, writers don't get heckled as much. So that, yeah. I invite it. It's good. So you can leave, <laughs> leave me some shitty messages. It's fine. It's um, more effort to heckle someone via email <laughs> as well. Yeah, there's no, not as much fur at the moment. I think maybe it's, the ideal heckle is when you can't even contain it. You know, you have to say something. Go, Bleh! your shit it's out. <laughs> but on the internet you've got to put a bit more thought into it sit down and type yeah it's, so it's only the most committed hecklers will do it online yeah so what is Rubber Dub Dub about it's about one man and his bath yeah. uh, it's about a guy who has a particularly stinky day job it's my obsession with escaping work, actually. Yeah. He has a particularly stinky day job, and uh, he discovers the art of self-care. So he gets into um, lovely, uh, you know, girly soaps and bubble bath and things. Uh, and, and as an older man as well, he's old, even older than us, Mark. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff in it about, you know, um, gender normativity. I don't make a big deal of that, but yeah. that is a theme. Uh, you know, um, so, he, you know, he's going into lovely soap shops and he's not really sure what to do and he has to you know there's a sales assistant who sort of takes him under her wing and teaches him about all this lovely stuff so he buys soap called um goddess uh snow fairy and uh something else lovely and sort of just learns to have a lovely time and he does it all through his bath uh so yeah that's part of it is about his bathtubs uh, <laughs> and the other part is about the horrible job itself which yeah. is uh he works on a train uh that goes up and down the length of the country so he goes between edinburgh and london and um as he moves up and down the sort of political values of people change and the sort of the uh the accents of people change which is good for you know it's fun uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice to write in people's accents yeah try, try and get it spot on um yeah so that's my novel in a nutshell right. when, whenever people say oh, what's the novel about i go oh god it's sort of about a man in a bath and uh, <laughs> i don't really know what i'm saying anymore uh but uh, i'm proud of it and i think yeah. it might be good so uh yeah if people <laughs> want to, if people want to buy my novel i don't feel too ashamed of saying buy it you might like it because yeah. i think it might be good I've, 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 I'm, I'm hearing lovely things about it so <laughs> Again, um, Fleece, who I interviewed in this very garden, said was saying nice things about it on Twitter the other she day. She was, yeah. She said good things about it, so that's so, good. If, yeah, you can impre- uh, if you can impress a nightingale, <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> they have high standards. Yes, very much so. But no, there is there's something about that, and you know, I I, I yeah, my day job is in engineering, but I do love a bath. So I, I, there's yeah. elements of that that I certainly relate to, and. Uh, I remember um, being in Plymouth for a week for for not very nice reason, not so long ago, and going into um, Lush. Is it Lush? Yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, Lush is in the book. And having the full sales pitch, and like normally I'd go, no, no, it's fine, leave me alone. But I was like, you know, the mood I was in and the way I was feeling. You're the man for like, my novel. Yeah, I probably am. His, his name is Mr. Bob. So you are <laughs> you are the new Mr. Bob. <laughs> and uh, and so yeah, I, I listened to the whole sales pitch. She was like, "What what do you want?" So I was like, oh, "Something that's going to help me go to sleep." And she's like, "Oh, well, this is our lavender section, and it's got this." And I was just like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, I remember once I was struggling to sleep in in my my I live in Glasgow, and I was struggling yeah. to sleep. And uh, I got up for a walk in the middle of the night and uh, Choyovna was still open. Choyovna is an amazing tea shop that's just closed down. It's a real sad loss. Yeah. But it was still open at about one in the morning. There must have just been, I don't know, there must have been a gig on or there must have just been tidying up. But I just went to talk to the guy. I said, oh, what have you got to help me sleep? And he just made this amazing potion. <laughs> I remember there was chamomile in it and something else and some sort of special honey. And it just—it was just exquisite. It just knocked me out. <laughs> but people don't know, do they? No, but it's nice sometimes to, to just embrace that and it's like I don't know maybe a a 99p bottle of Radox would have done the same job but if you're willing to sort of buy into it yes and say yeah yeah and go okay well yeah maybe all these ingredients in the shape of a star covered in glitter will help me have a nice relaxing bath and why not it's (laughs) it's it's an accessible luxurious experience right yeah and uh, i think in the book there's a bit where uh, mr bob finds um, uh, like a women's magazine in the netting uh, in the in the train yeah. and uh, he's reading it and there's a, a very critical piece about how self-care is a rip-off and it's actually just a way of selling soap to gullible people and he just feels a bit foolish and <laughs> told off for it because actually for him it did make a difference yeah. uh, so i like that bit in the book <laughs> i like the it's supposed to be pathos you know yeah. a little bit of uh, you know oh poor guy <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that's. I look forward to that. Then that sounds right. I would have brought you one. Yeah, no, I'll no, send no. you one. I'll send you one. <laughs> I don't mind paying my way as well. That's the other thing. I don't mind supporting people I'm a fan of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it goes both ways. That's very, very kind of it. I was shocked <laughs> when you pulled your jumper off in the kitchen to reveal that. I think I went, I've got to show you something. I started taking my clothes off and you probably thought, oh, it's what's going on? It's not that kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we've mentioned him a little bit already, but I feel like... The elephant in the room. Yeah, there's no way that he can't get brought up. The freezing cold, sub-zero elephant in the room. <laughs> Anthony Irvine. Yeah, the the legend. The man that brought us together. Yeah, he is, yeah. and He's responsible for even worse things. (laughs) It's the least of his crime. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, so I'm guessing that came away, it came around in a similar way to the Club Z book of you wanting to know more about him and going, no one else is going to write this, so I should. Yes, I thought the itch was scratched with the Club Zarathustra book. I thought, well, I know everything that is retrievable. All the information that exists about Club Zarathustra, I have found it. Uh, But when the book came out, people started emailing and saying, oh, I saw it. One of the good ones was I still got my ticket stubs, and she found them out, scanned those ticket stubs. So there are other little bits and bobs that aren't in the book that yeah. have since come out and there were a couple of comedians I couldn't find at the time and one of them was the Iceman and uh, I didn't expect to be able to find him because so many French performers of the 80s are just gone yeah. you know they've either stopped doing it uh, they've passed on even or they just have a different life now and if they had a stage name you quite often just you, you'll yeah. never find them and because they're older they might not have anything on the internet so that was true of the Iceman and I just thought well God bless him he's wandered off into the world now and that's the ice is behind him you know, that's, <laughs> that's the end of it we'll never speak to him but when I was interviewing people for You Are Nothing the yeah. Club Z book they'd always remember the Iceman without any you know there was a lot of uh head scratching involved in this book like oh do I remember this thing do I remember that thing and uh, am I just you know did somebody tell me about this and I think I remember it but I don't there's all that sort of thing and that was fun but it was hard to separate the truth from the bullshit yeah. uh, but everyone without fail remembered the Iceman but I couldn't get him and then in 2011 Stuart Lee got him out of retirement to do one show in um, was it Festival Hall yeah. the Royal Festival Hall show yeah um, and I think because of that it gave him a bit of a boost to the confidence and he started putting his paintings online because his new thing is painting he's yeah. a bit visual artist now um, so this website popped up Anthony Irvine and I thought I think that's him iceblocked.com iceblocked.co.uk oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I think that's him uh, but I was I was still a bit scared of getting in touch. I didn't really know what to expect. Like this is the legend of the Ice Man. I can't just email him. Um, but then we had a mutual friend. I was doing an interview like this yeah. with a guy, uh, John Fleming, who does uh, comedy interviews, usually written ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, he he's great. He's been in comedy for years. And uh, he just said, "Oh, I, I know Anthony. I'll just introduce you." <laughs> so it, it was another one of those things where it was simple as that. And he was willing to talk. Yeah. And we got along really well. And it was another one where I thought there might be an article in this, but then it was actually maybe there's a book in it. And part of one of the things I knew about the Ice Man was he took Polaroid photographs of the ice before he melted it. Yeah. So my first thought was maybe it could be a little art book, just a little one with ice blocks. Yeah, that, like that, a tabletop book. Tabletop yeah, book, yeah, yeah. and that'll be all it is. Um, but then I thought, well, maybe we could do an interview and that'll run alongside the pictures. Uh, but then, of course, he's a visual artist now. So he said, well, can I put my paintings in it? So yeah, of course, let's do that. The book will be not just a history book, it'll be a living thing with yeah. your current work in it. So we just made this wonderful book. I think it's the book I'm most proud of. Okay. The only reason I'm hesitating is because I've written a novel now, and that yeah. was a long time coming. <laughs> but it's certainly one of the books I'm the proudest of. You know, I think together we worked really well. He was very giving with his answers. He's got a good memory. He actually remembers stuff, which yeah. was always a problem with the Club Zarathustra crowd, was getting him to actually remember stuff. But he's got a very good memory, and he's got so many mad stories. He was in the circus. He was in the last ever boxing kangaroo act, <laughs> and he was a proper clown as well with makeup and everything. It's a very, for a clown-minded comedian, it's yeah. a very romantic image. You know, the, the last of the the proper clowns. You know, and um, he was very giving with these stories, and they're wonderful. Yeah. So please buy the book, not for me, but for yourself to enjoy these. Yeah stories that would have just gone nowhere they would have just been lost if we hadn't have got it on paper you yeah know? 
He he just brings me so much joy. Like whether it's when he emails me, when he DMs me, or you know the 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 time that I've met him in real life, he, he I can't help but just feel so happy and so he's just such a joyous man. He he is yes <laughs> he is he's just a pleasure to be around yeah. and um, he has a very um, I almost said a confidence, but I don't know if that's right because there there's definitely something holding him back from doing everything he wants yeah. to do actually. Uh, but but when he does something, it's just glorious. So you, you went to his art show, of course, yes. didn't you? Yes, yeah, Fun times. I l- loved it. Yeah, spent like again probably two or three hours with him yeah. at the art show, and, and and just again so giving and so and I was like, do you want? Or oh, he suggested it. I was going to make it sound like it was my suggestion, but I was like, I'm going to come down on this date. And he messaged me and was like, oh, maybe you could bring a camera. And maybe, I was like, oh, maybe I could. He, he is good with his uh, promotion. <laughs> yeah. very he does a YouTube video, you know, a 13-second long YouTube video every day, pretty much. A tiny I've been thing. loving those. They're so well. sweet. Yeah, I've been really enjoying his he, little He gets bit. about 23 views on each one. <laughs> That's you and me. And- I, know, I was going to say, there's, there's like two likes on most of them as well. That's it's probably me. me. <laughs> But he's a wonderful man. But it's not just that he's a wonderful man. Even if he was a complete bastard, I would have loved his work anyway. The idea of the melting the block thing is great. <laughs> it's the closest thing I can think to of that is apparently Johnny Vegas used... I never, this is another yeah. thing I never saw. Johnny <laughs> Vegas used to do a potter's wheel thing on stage. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's like, why not do something like yeah. that? I had an idea for cutting hair. Could you uh, just give someone a haircut and, on stage yeah. and just be talking? Because as long as you've got something to busy your hands with, you can get into this slightly zen state yeah. in your head. And I think maybe the Iceman did that. You know, he's trying <laughs> to melt the ice, but he's still just talking and doing his monologues. Um, he presented you with a painting as well while... Uh... He did. Yeah. <laughs> uh... And you, is that pride of place in your house? Is it? Did you take... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, right. The reason Mark is asking it in that way is because he knows full well that I forgot it. I left it at the venue. <laughs> I mean, it's not as insulting as it sounds. No. I, I travelled from Glasgow to <laughs> Devon to get this painting. So I'm the biggest idiot in the story. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was to be uh, accepted on the night of the, you know, the, the opening night of his art show. And I was supposed to do a 10 minute bit on stage of like, like an acceptance speech was the idea. So I did all of that. It went really well. And then I bloody forgot it. Yeah. I just left it. I think I left it on the stage or on one of the seats just off the stage or something. Uh, because there was so much going on. And yeah. I was meeting all these other people <laughs> who that helped with the book and stuff and meeting fans of his and having a chat and trying to sell books and help him sell paintings. And I just completely just forgot. Uh, and it's such a shame. It was one that I specifically chose out. You yeah. know, I've, I've been looking through his catalogue of artworks for such a long time now. But I actually found a favourite. And it's uh, just a picture of a block of ice you can see the audience in the background. My, that's my favourite thing. I like in the Polaroids when you yeah. can see a bit of the audience in the background. That always makes me laugh. <laughs> and uh, there's actually a, 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 <laughs> there's a dead spider yes. in the paint. I think it's either a spider or a daddy long legs. Yeah, there's something in the middle of the block, <laughs> isn't there? So I like that. So <laughs> we're having it. And it is going to be Pride of Place eventually in our house. Yeah. It's going to be in the entryway to our flat above the living room door. And we're going to, no expense spared, get it in the best possible frame we can find. And it's going to look mint. <laughs> but I forgot it. So I keep thinking, shall I send him the money to ship it? Or am I going to see him again soon? Yeah. And I'm hoping to see him again soon. So we'll, we'll have, exactly. use it as an excuse for a hangout. Exactly. I, I, if I'd have known that I was going to be seeing you so soon after... Afterwards, I, I could have, I could have halved the journey for you. Yeah, me? you could have got it halfway, <laughs> and I could have picked it up from here. Ah, oh, never mind. You but don't yeah, know what you don't know. <laughs> I, I brought one home with me as well, and it's going to be pride of place. I just need to find the right oh, frame. You'll have for to show it me again. later yeah, which yeah, yeah. one you went for. But um, so I think, I think that's as that's as much as I want to pick from your brains for today, Robert. Okay, that's, okay. Uh, so where do you want to send people then if people have found you interesting from this yeah uh... I mean why would they but (laughs) if they have please buy any of my books Uh, Mark will put a link down but I probably melt it I think probably if you're watching this you might have an interest in the Iceman and alternative comedy Mm -hmm. yeah go to Go Faster Stripe and buy Melt It about the Iceman and buy You Are Nothing about Club Zarathustra. And if you want to be kind to me, you could buy Stern Plastic Owl while you're there as well. And you get a free pin badge for this one as you well. Do. You do. The pin badge is a recreation of the ones they used to wear back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Robert, thank you ever so much for joining oh, me in my for garden. Having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Bye.
Enjoy your sofa.